Hi, I'm Danielle Peterson from Infrastructure News. Today we're talking to John Roxborough from the Concrete Institute School of Concrete Technology and we'll be talking about the evolution of training tools and the need for concrete technology training. This is CPD On Demand. John, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, um, I'm from a, a building science background. I've been with the School of Concrete Technology for the last seven years and I've also got an advanced concrete technology uh, diploma. Okay, John, with the skills shortage in South Africa, is there a greater need for concrete technology training? Well, the, the concrete industry and the concrete related industry is actually massive. And uh, so there's a, a, a huge demand for uh, skills uh, in concrete and concrete technology. Um, the industry uh, comprises of cement producers and uh, uh, construction companies, admixture companies, laboratories. So all of these need people that know about uh, concrete, from uh, laborers to uh, salesmen to technicians, um, and even in management, people know, need to know uh, about concrete. Okay, and can a lack of sufficient knowledge of concrete technology not only reduce the longevity of structures, but also be very dangerous? And maybe you can give us some examples because there have been some very well publicized failures of concrete. Well we've seen in recent times uh, a, a number of buildings co collapse and a lot of these a lot of these things we actually don't hear about uh, uh, further up in Africa. We we often don't hear, I just heard the other day that there have been five collapses in Kenya uh, of buildings and um, a knowledge of, uh, of concrete on site, a good practical knowledge of concrete on site will go a long way in preventing some of these these accidents. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think it's, it is very uh, essential. Um, having said that, also um, just knowing the basics, uh, simple basics and concepts about concrete on site, you're going to add a lot to the longevity and the durability of the, the concrete. Um, the concrete, uh, its durability is very, very dependent on good site practice. Uh, so you might have a, a very good concrete, nicely designed, but if you don't uh, mm. do the correct site practice, in other words, placing, compacting, and curing it correctly, um, you could end up with a building that's not going to last nearly as long as it should. Okay. Now, um, the Concrete Institute and many of its predecessors has offered training, and the Concrete Institute School of Concrete Technology does do some training. Perhaps you can tell us a bit about the training that you cover and who it's aimed at? Okay. The, the, the school for example, this year we'll offer 16 different courses. And the, the philosophy behind the school is that there's a stepped approach to mm -hmm. gaining concrete uh, knowledge. So we have different levels. Um, so our level one courses are aimed more at the, 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 the lower end, uh, the labor on site, or maybe uh, sales people, in, uh, technical sales people. Mm -hmm. And then for people that are in a more uh, uh, leadership position on sites such as foremen and uh, uh, site agents, we have level two courses, and that uh, those courses uh, uh, concentrate a lot on uh, practice, the correct practice mm -hmm. of concrete practice on site, and then we've got the higher level courses which are uh, aimed more at the management and then the the, the university graduate um, to to enhance their knowledge of concrete. Uh, we find that a, a lot of the graduates uh, coming out of universities actually know very little about concrete and they can enhance their careers a lot by actually specializing a little bit in concrete and we have the courses here to, to, to be able to um, help them with that. John, since training first began at the school we've into the digital age and computers are becoming more and more commonplace in education. How has um, the school ad adapted that for themselves and are there any um, new developments planned around this? Okay, there's, there's a, a huge worldwide trend to mm -hmm. do online uh, uh, training and uh, we're very, very happy to announce that we have now uh, developed uh, two courses for the online e-learning uh, platform. Mm -hmm. um, so we are getting into this this um, medium. 
and it, it gives us a, a, a much broader base of, of potential students mm. and uh, the e-learning platform allows the, the, the professional guy that ca hasn't got time to come and mm. sit on, on a, a, a course here at our school. He can during the day sign on and uh, go through his course and there's no time limit and um, I think it's going to be uh, a huge positive for the school and we, mm. we're planning to now implement further with uh, the different courses on that. Okay, and in terms of you know the school's influence, do you operate outside of South Africa? Um, we can provide training anywhere in the world actually, but we, we, are, we do concentrate on Africa. There's uh, huge potential growth in Africa and there's a massive lack of uh, concrete skills. Mm -hmm. And so uh, often South African companies that have sub subsidiaries in, in African countries will ask us to go and do uh, mm -hmm. courses in those countries and recently, quite recently we've been done a uh, course in Lagos, Nigeria, we've been into Zambia, Swaziland, Namibia, so there is huge potential and, and there looks like there's going to be a bit of uh, training in uh, Kenya as well. Okay, and I suppose your, your online program comes into play there as well because it's far-reaching. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. So already on this, these, this platform that we've got, we have got people from um, Kenya and also um, other places in Africa. Yeah. Okay, and in terms of your experience in Africa, would you say there are, there are areas where the skills are more lacking and are there specific areas that need to focus a lot on building their concrete knowledge? Uh, to be honest with you, the, the whole of Africa, and, mm. and that includes South Africa, there is mm. a, there's a huge lack of skills. John, can you elaborate a bit more on your courses and what they involve and can they be adapted then to suit specific companies' needs? Okay, our, our whole uh, school program is uh, divided into various levels. So you have mm -hmm. a level one, a level two, three, four and five. And our, our approach is a stepped approach. So anybody can enter at any level. Mm -hmm. And typically your lower level, your workers on site would enter in at the, the, the level one and then um, have the confidence to go forward to the level two and if you are a graduate you may be in the, in the, in at, at a level uh, three. Um, from level two we have CPT accreditation so mm -hmm. our courses from level two all have CPT accreditation. The um, Adapting the courses, uh, often when we are lecturing we, we, we find that uh, there's a certain need so if we're lecturing to a certain client there's a certain need so we we will automatically adapt that course as we're lecturing. But if there is a specific need, we can change the course accordingly. Um, of course, we can't call, uh, change it uh, too much. Uh, we don't want to lose the CPT mm. accreditations, but there is a certain amount of uh, leeway. Our high-end courses, which is uh, level four and up, mm -hmm. they are internationally recognized because uh, we do the courses through the Institute of Concrete Technology in London which is uh, very well known all over the world. And so our, our level four, which we call the SCT 41 and 42 courses, and then the advanced concrete technology courses, are we, at the end of the course, we, um, they will write exams, and those exams are set by the ICT in London. And uh, with the certificates and the diplomas you get from that uh, is international recogni recognition. Mm -hmm. Our lower level courses, are extremely well known in industry. So a guy can go with a, an SCT20 concrete practice certificate anywhere in South Africa and people know what that is. Mm. I can also mention that you know there are a lo lot of um, ex external uh, service providers that, uh, that give courses. The, the problem with those is they could be very good courses but a person getting a certificate from that and taking that into industry mm. Um, often people don't know what it is and uh, so it, it's to me it's more advisable to go to an industry where we're uh, you know a, a service provider that that people know in the industry. There's been an emergence of sort of unscrupulous training providers and is there awareness around this and what are the dangers of you know falling prey to these kinds of training programs? Okay uh, there are a lot of these uh, uh, service providers mm. out there and they are there t to make money. Mm. Um, the, the, the Concrete Institute is an NGO, we're not here to make money. 
Um, and we base our courses on what's needed in, in South Africa. So, so mm -hmm. sometimes people will sign up onto a course and you'll have a lecturer from overseas and he cannot relate in any form or manner to, uh, to the South African industry. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is uh, our courses are well known in the industry. So you, mm -hmm. you take your certificate from a, a, another provider to, to, to a potential job opportunity and people will say, well, what is it? Mm. And w w is there any substance behind it? Mm. So uh, th that's why we recommend people go through the institute. And if people get training that's not of the right standard, does that create a danger on construction sites or potential you know, failure of structures? Well, it's, it's important for anybody mm. in the construction industry to know the capabilities of the people uh, doing, mm. the, doing the work. And you want to know that they have a certain competency, and if mm. they don't have that competency, you could end up with um, problems with your concrete. Mm. The one thing about concrete, and we emphasize that in the school, is that you've got to get it right the first time. Mm. And uh, we spend a lot of time uh, lecturing to people about that. Uh, concrete can cost a lot of money if you don't get it right. And so our courses are aimed at giving the, 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 the students the tools to get it right the first time. Okay, and you recently visited the world of concrete in Las Vegas. Were there any noteworthy developments for the industry coming out of there? The world of concrete in Vegas is massive. Everything in the United States is massive. Uh, uh, but the, the world of concrete, it took me four, four days of walking around and I still didn't see everything. Uh, Looking for new technology, I didn't see so much new technology. But what that the whole conference is uh, is aimed at is for the guy, the, the 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 concrete practitioner on site. And it was very interesting for me to walk around because you see that the, the trend is to make thing, make machinery or tools or equipment that will facilitate. Uh, somebody, a concrete practitioner, doing the job correctly, more efficiently and uh, cheaper. So I think that's the, the trend and, and for me to have gone there and, and seen what that, I can transfer that in, in my lectures mm -hmm. to people um, and give them that sort of knowledge that there, there, are, there is the sort of kind of equipment out there that can mm -hmm. help you do your job more easily. And is that kind of equipment not prominently used right now on, on our construction sites? Well, the, the American um, setup is is it it's not as labor as intensive so they they will have mechanical wheelbarrows so because yeah. we've got we've got five or six guys on our site that can push wheelbarrows they've just got one guy with a mechanical wheelbarrow pushing using that one wheel yeah. wheelbarrow so it is a, a, a little bit geared for for um a, a, a not a labor intensive but a, a labor shortage but uh, having said that, uh, South Africa could learn a lot from how they do uh, things in, in concrete in, the, in, in the America. John, can you tell us a bit about some of the common problems and mistakes that you see in the school um, and where engineers and technicians are going wrong and how do you address these problems? Okay, the, 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 with concrete, unfortunately, many problems uh, do occur, and uh, some of them are very difficult to uh, to prevent. But we, we gear our courses to try and prevent these problems. So, let me just give you a, a sort of synopsis of the, the major problems that we get in concrete. So, um, any concrete that's put down in thin layers particularly our sand cement mixes, we often get problems with those. So our plasters and screeds, because they're so thin, because they contain so much water, uh, we mm -hmm. find that they crack a lot. Um, the, the other big problem that we get is floors, industrial floors. Um, our major consultancy in the, in the institute is actually industrial floors. They tend to be very, very problematic, even though they appear to be so simple to, mm -hmm. to construct. Um, and then another problem that we often see is uh, the concrete doesn't come up to strength. And that's, a, that's a, quite a, a hair-raising problem for an engineer that must sign off on a, uh, on a building. So 
our courses will deal with all of these. We do have specialized courses. For example, we have a specialized industrial floor course. We have a, a course that is designed uh, for specification of concrete because mm -hmm. often concrete doesn't come up to strength because the specification is incorrect. And um, the, the, the engineer specifying the concrete hasn't taken into account the high extender value of the cement or, or, or um, the type of aggregate that's been used. And so we'll, we'll see problems occurring uh, according to that. The, the professional team, there's, a, there's a, a big need in the professional team to have a knowledge of concrete. So if you look at the, the quantities of as, uh, our tenders are, are, are unfortunately usually done on price. So the lowest tender wins. And um, uh, of course you're going to win the tender if you get the lowest, but I think if the professional team looked at the longevity of building, the durability of the building, um, the, the, the cost of running that building, the life cycle cost of the building is, uh, is, is much more than the, the original cost of the building. And at the, the development stage for that building, I think it's very important that the project team knows about concrete because there you're going to save, save a lot of money on the life cycle uh, costs of that, that building. So the quantity surveyor, he needs to, when, he, when he's pricing, he needs to know about the concrete, the concrete mix design, because you can save a lot of money by putting in the right concrete mix design. The, um, the guy on site, the, 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 the building manager, he needs to know about uh, good concrete practice and uh, you know he, he, he sweats when the, the concrete is um, in its plastic state. I mean, it's, I mean, it, uh, he's, he's very concerned. He's only got about three hours to, to place and compact that concrete and get it right. So, so that, that kind of guy will, will benefit greatly from um, good concrete practice. The engineer, he starts to worry a lot uh, when the concrete has set. He is now uh, very concerned about strength. And of course, a little bit about dur durability. And not enough, I always say we need to concentrate more on, on durability. So for an engineer, by, by um, having a good sound concrete technology background, he's able to um, deal with those strength and durability issues. Architects, um, architects deal with facades. They, they, they deal with the, the look of the building. And uh, typically, we, we get a lot of disappointed architects um, because they don't know concrete technology. So they will spec a beautiful mm. off-shutter finish and when the guys take the, the shutters away it, there's many shades of grey. And, um, and then I, I get phone calls saying that they are so uh, very disappointed in concrete. But having a concrete technology background, a little bit of education concrete mm. technology that doesn't need to, to happen. Um, so there, there are little things that we can uh, do to prevent uh, any disappointment. John, can you take us into a bit more detail on some of your high-level courses and how engineers can apply this kind of information practically? And perhaps we can specifically look at specification and durability because you've mentioned those are very significant yeah. problems. Well, we've, we've got two, two uh, very good one-day courses. Mm -hmm. um, the one is for basically specific, uh, specification for engineers, uh, you know, specifying concrete for engineers. And then the other one is on the durability of concrete. So if you look at the, the, the one design for specification of, of, of concrete, uh, uh, it's, it's quite interesting and I always joke in my classes because you, I always say you look at a construction drawing and if you look carefully enough, somewhere in a, a little corner you'll see the strength of the concrete. And that's all that is specified. And this uh, is uh, actually not good at all. Um, when specifying concrete, uh, I, I always uh, t t tell people that there, there are a number of things you've got to look at. First of all, you've got to look at the price. A lot can be done with concrete mix design to bring down the price of your concrete. Um, then you've got to look at the plastic properties of the concrete. Um, can you have, do you have the right properties of the concrete to 
do the job correctly and get the right finishes on your concrete. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're pouring a, a, a suspended slab, your properties of the concrete have to be totally different to, for example, if you're pouring uh, columns. A lot of engineers don't see this. Um, in, a, in pouring columns, you don't want a concrete that bleeds a lot. If you're pouring concrete on a, on a, on a, a ground floor, an industrial floor, you maybe want the concrete to bleed a little bit. So the, 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 it's a very important thing, the, 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 the actual flow characteristics and the, the uh, cohesiveness of the concrete when placing uh, and trying to finish off that concrete. Uh, another specification you must specification, uh, specify for the hardened properties. Uh, when specifying for the hardened properties, we get our strength, which is probably the most important. But we also need to look at, at durability. Um, another uh, part of the specification is we need to worry a lot about the heat buildup in that concrete. So in your bigger pores, your big mass foundations. Uh, heat can be extremely problematic and even if you're not dealing with uh, uh, big pores you, uh, your, your normal concrete can be exposed to the elements and you need to have specified the concrete that, uh, in a way that it's going to be able to um, perform in the very hot or very cold environment and part of that specification maybe is, is how you're going to cure the, the concrete. And then, of course, the last thing, and it's very important, it's coming more and more important in, um, in the world today, is that we want to, to be eco-friendly and we want our, uh, when, we, when you're putting a whole lot of energy into building a building, you want it to be efficient. And one of the ways you make a concrete building efficient is to make it durable so that you don't have to spend a lot of time on the maintenance. And I think it's a very important um, element of the specification that you maybe start specifying durability index, the indexes. Uh, I know some of the um, uh, uh, peristatals like the Sanral and Eskim and Transnet are starting to specify these durability indexes so that um, that they are assured of uh, a, a reasonable longevity in, in the mm. concrete. And what are some of the challenges in terms of specification? Well, interestingly, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, on a construction drawing, if you search carefully enough, you sometimes will just find the, the strength mm -hmm. of the concrete. And that's a challenge that the actually engineers actually created for himself because when you get onto site, often the ready mix guys will come and as at a point of courtesy, will show you the mix design. So they put the mix design in front of the engineer and say, please will you sign it? Please will you sign this off that you are happy with this mix design? And that's a very big, big, big problem with, uh, that's created by the engine himself by just specifying a strength. Mm -hmm. Because now he suddenly has a mixed design and he has to look at what the extender content is in the, the, the cement, what kind of aggregate they're using, what sort of workability you're going to get out of that concrete. And um, he now must put his uh, name against that. And he's basically making himself a bit responsible for the actual concrete. So when they start mm -hmm. pouring that concrete and it's not going into the shutters correctly, they'll say, but your engineer checked it. Mm -hmm. So this is why we, we reiterate that it's very important to actually give more specifications on the actual kind of concrete. So one of the things is that, that you must be more detailed in your workability and how that, that concrete is going to move and, and flow on site what sort of heat buildups are going to happen to in that concrete. Uh, an engineer must know what the extenders are going to do with that concrete. We have, uh, uh, often we hear, hear of industrial floors put down with a very high extender content and those floors t tend to end up with uh, surface problems because of the curing. Uh, other things that happen with, uh, with, with just signing off the, the, the concrete um, is we we find that the cost could be a, a, a lot higher. If the engineer had specified a minimum or maximum a cement content, if you'd specified what type of cement, uh, he could also specify what water cement ratio he wants. All of these things will help with the actual job, the cost and uh, the performance of that, uh, that building. We find uh, uh, also that the engineers are, are put under a lot of pressure to sign off on concrete that is not has not formed to the right strength. It, uh, you know they've done the testing, and the concrete's not coming up to the right strength, and uh, there's a lot of pressure on those engineers to sign off saying that the concrete 
you know, people feel that the concrete will get to the right strength. And so you have to go to cores, and if the cores aren't strong enough, there's still uh, a lot of pressure put on the engineer to now go and relook at his design, and who's going to actually pay for that engineer to, mm. to relook at the design? So if the, all of these problems can be sorted up, sorted out right up front, um, uh, uh, and, and the engineer doesn't then have to take that responsibility. Uh, people forget that an engineer can be 96 years old and on his deathbed, he still carries the responsibility for the work he's signed off on. He never ever, a doctor is very lucky his patients die, um, and, and so he doesn't take responsibility after the, the patient's died. Uh, an engineer never gets away from that uh, responsibility. And uh, if things are done correctly with the concrete, he can uh, at least sleep easily at night. John, how do you go about making concrete more impermeable? Okay, there, there are various techniques that you can use. Um, the first thing that I would look at is the proportioning of the ingredients in the concrete. So it's very crucial to, to have a good sand grading um, if you've got a good sand, this is one of those things with concrete, if you've got a good sand, you can reduce the amount of water. And by reducing the amount of water, you can reduce the amount of cement. But also by reducing the amount of water, you end up with a far less porous concrete. So, one of the a sort of more old-fashioned way of making concrete more uh, less permeable is to increase the strength of concrete. You can either lower the water cement ratio or you can put more cement in. The more modern sort of take on it is now you, you get a good sand grading, good, uh, good uh, stone aggregate, but then you use make use of um, extenders. So your fly ash and your slags, particularly fly ash, uh, and, and also silica fume as well will make, uh, give you a much uh, finer pore structure in, in your concrete and his, uh, hence less uh, uh, permeable. Uh, another wonderful thing about uh, extenders is that you're going to minimize on thermal cracking because if you use your high extended cements and you cure well, you've got to cure well, um, you'll, you'll find that uh, there's less chance of uh, thermal cracking. Another uh, thing that you have to do to make your concrete less permeable is you've got to stop cracking. So there's various things that can uh, cause cracking in the concrete. So you get cracking that happens in the plastic state of the concrete. Um, and mo most of these cracks that occur either in the plastic state or the hardened state are caused by the concrete wanting to move and we're holding it back. So we're restraining the movement of the concrete. And that concrete typically wants to move because the water is evaporating out of it. Um, so it's that we're losing water both internally to, into the, the, the aggregates in the, the concrete, we're losing it in the, the cement uh, cementous reaction with the, with the water, and then we're losing it due to uh, loss of water. And shrinkage occurs due to loss of water. If you think of a bit of uh, bultong or a piece of soap or a piece of bread you leave in the sun, it does shrink, and that's due to the lack of water. So we get shrinkage, and if we restrain that shrinkage, guess what, we get cracking. And of course a crack is a highway into the concrete. We also get uh, cracking um, and voids due to bleeding in the concrete. So we've got to make a concrete that doesn't bleed, but if you make a concrete that doesn't bleed, you make, uh, you make yourself vulnerable to the surface of the concrete to cracking because now there's less water at the surface to prevent the cracking. So there is you know, we, we always say that concrete is, is, is uh, it's not black or white. It's, we're always trying to find that gray area. There's always a compromise. So what you're doing in the plastic state, you're going to have a, uh, a consequence in the hardened state. So we always have to try and find that, that happy gray uh, middle ground. Mm -hmm. So extenders will help reduce per permeability. Now, another very good thing to reduce permeability, and this is particularly at the surface of the concrete, if you don't cure properly, it has a massive effect on the surface of the concrete. Deeper down in the concrete, when you're curing, you're not going to get water to those um, uh, parts, that are the, you know, in the, the thicker sections. You're not going to get water to cure the concrete. But on the surface, that first, I would say, first 100 millimeters is crucial. Now, remember, your steel is sitting somewhere between 20 and 40 millimeters below the surface. Now, you are worried about that steel getting to a point where it can start corroding. So you need to cure 
make a very much finer pore structure and um, research shows that the absorption of concrete, concrete likes to suck in water, is reduced substantially by curing properly. Now, a very modern trend uh, and, and a lot of people are, are using it and I, it's, I, I, I have nothing against it but uh, crystalline waterproofing agents. So that's another way we can go about it. Now, unfortunately, we're seeing a trend that it's a fix-all. You put these water, uh, crystalline waterproofing uh, um, agents into the concrete and then you feel you can just walk away from the concrete and it's going to be um, waterproof. And that is not so. So if, uh, my, my advice to engineers, if you're feeling like using a waterproofing uh, crystalline agent, um, make sure that it's not just going to add a lot of cost to the, uh, the, the, your, your concrete and not actually give you the, the, the correct waterproofing. But having said that, if applied correctly, they are very, very good at waterproofing your concrete and making it less permeable. So I think that's, that covers most of the things with regard to um, making your concrete uh, less permeable. Another thing with durability, sorry, I, I must mention this, mm. is concrete can be extremely durable in one environment, but perform terribly in another. So an engineer has to take into account the environment that you are going to put that concrete into. So if you put a certain concrete into sulfate, um, a high sulfate uh, content uh, ground and it's not designed to to um, to deal with that sulfate it's not going to work at all mm. so be very careful and be uh, uh, understand the environment you're going to put um, on your the, the most corrosive environments for for concrete are are typically your sea walls your harbor walls where you get wave action you get a lot of salts and sulfurs um, the, the, the concrete has to withstand a lot on a, on a sea wall where you get the tidal action wet dry uh, and another another very gross environment is is industrial chimneys where you get very high acidic, acidic gases it's a funny thing with concrete as well is you your concrete becomes more susceptible to attack if you get a wet dry we call it a tidal zone in other words it's getting wet and then it's allowed to dry it. Wet again, allowed to dry it. So we've got to look at um, a, a concrete in those sort of environments. Given all of these pressures that are on engineers, should they be considering specialising in concrete? Well, I always like to encourage uh, engineers to specialise in concrete. And one of the main reasons is that there are very, very, very few engineers in this country that really know about concrete. And so if you can specialize in concrete, you, 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 you are really putting yourself at a huge advantage. And there's huge scope for work by knowing concrete. So in consultancy, it's not just a question of designing. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, consult to laboratories, you can consult to admixture companies. Um, so the, the, there's, um, by, by making yourself unique and knowing about concrete, I, I think you definitely are making yourself more valuable. I, I personally feel that every consultancy should have a concrete specialist engineer. Every construction company should have an engineer that has specialized in concrete. And uh, the, 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 the scope is endless. You know, even if you're not going to use your engineering mm -hmm. profession, people always like engineers because of their, their background and the way of thinking. And, um, and you can go a long way with concrete. Uh, I, I know engineers that have gone into the designing of machines to place and, and work with concrete. So um, I don't think you can lose by specialising in concrete. Okay, and just to end off, what is your take then on the future of Portland Cement? Right, so Portland Cement, uh, Portland is a brilliant brand name. You, you know, it's like Coca-Cola. It, it was very cleverly named by Aspidin, who, who originally patented it, it's probably one of the most widely researched materials in the world. Huge amount of research is coming out um, every year on uh, Portland cement. So there are other types of uh, uh, binders that are now being promoted uh, for concrete. But we've got to be just a little bit careful. The, the research isn't there. 
we haven't seen the problems of, of, of what, what, what these new concretes can do. So you've got to go carefully into these new products. So it's going to take a bit of time. Portland cement is very easy to make and there is an abundance of limestone which is the main ingredients that make up cement um, whereas there's not an abundance of these other materials that they're making these other binders from. So I've got this feeling that uh, Portland cement is going to be here for a long time in future. And if you think about it, every single thing you do today has got concrete linked to it. You got to this interview due to concrete. Right, thanks. Right, thank you John for your insights and your expertise on concrete technology. Um, this is CPD On Demand brought to you by Infrastructure News.